Blue Chew is the chewable tablet that is revolutionizing the way that guys approach their intimate moments. Visit BlueChew.com today and meet with a licensed medical provider to assess your individual needs. And you can try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today went from a homeless alcohol and drug addict to an incredibly successful OnlyFans star. Now she's starting conversations around the stigma of sex work through some very sexy and controversial billboards in the UK. Please welcome Eliza Rose Watson. Hi. Hi. So, Eliza, you're in the UK, and I have to say your name is so English. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess let's start from the beginning. Um, your story starts years before you ever posed nude. When did you first start to have problems with drugs and alcohol? So I started drinking alcohol when I was about 14, and that's pretty mm-hmm. normal for my culture. Um mm-hmm. and from the get-go, I was kind of like a blackout drunk, right? But I would be lying if I said it was always awful, like from the word go, like nobody says, oh, I'm just going to trash my whole life with alcohol and drugs. So, you know, there were some really funny times in my early drinking, like at 14, 15, some things are absolutely hilarious that would be absolutely mortifying when you're 23, 24. And I think um, at some point around then it, it turned on me. It was a bit like when you're out all night and you're dancing and you're having a great time in a club and then the end of the night comes and the lights switch on, you know, and you look around and you're actually dancing with a weirdo and the space is just a horrible sweaty box and you're looking around and you've lost your friends and you're like, hey, like, what happened? And it was a bit like that. Um, Yeah, I would say late teens, early 20s, it became, it wasn't my friend anymore. Wow. That's pretty fast. So I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually sober from alcohol for uh, five years now, but I've been in like a 12 step program for 15 years. So like, that's awesome. Sobriety is like my favorite topic. Cause I, just like you, I struggled with alcohol addiction, like really hard, but I have to say, I mean, for you to get to that point so early, I mean, you know, late teens, early twenties, I didn't get sober for the first time until I was 28. I mean, I needed to get sober many years before that, Mm. but you know, late teens, early twenties, I was, you know, in college and like, I thought it was all fine. I figured I would, I partied too hard, but I figured I'd outgrow it. So what do you think like got you to that point so quickly? Well, I think like, I was a bit like you and in my sobriety journey and that's awesome snow, by the way. I didn't know that. And that's amazing. Like, congratulations. Um, I didn't get sober until I was 27. Um, but I think I packed a lot in, I think it went, it took me quite fast, um, from, yeah, that whole thing of like, yeah, I've got a bit of a problem, but it's not a problem, you know, like, it's just who I am to like suicide attempts, hospital, hospitals, arrests, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And you just get to a point, they say, don't they, a a point of desperation, a gift of desperation. Yeah. And, um. Yeah, it wasn't like a quick fix for me. I didn't just walk into a recovery situation and get sober. Um, But I was 26 when I actually um, made my first attempt um, at recovery. And uh, yeah, there were there were lots of points. If you if you look back, right, there's many points where I can think, I mean, even as 20 years old, like waking up from a really ropey one night stand. I remember thinking, I this isn't who I am, but you ignore it. Like I ignore it because by that point, I didn't know this, but that's the only thing I relied on to get me through life, right? So it's, it's not something that I wanna look at that I wanna stop, right? So it took quite a lot of those times before I finally, you know, made an attempt to change it. And uh, 
it was just luck really that after one of those times it was a particularly bad one I think I throw myself in a river or something like something like that and I was scared to be by myself um and a woman came just came came to my house my mum's friend uh me and my mum weren't even talking uh but my mum's friend came to my house and uh told me she was a recovered addict and alcoholic and that was the first time I thought you know all right, well, I don't want to be here, so I'll go with you. And that was kind of it, really. Mm. Did you have um, an idea of what you thought an alcoholic was before you got sober? Because I remember for me, you know, I, I started to get that inkling too that I had a problem like early on, you know. And again, like I said, I kept figuring like I would grow out of it, you know, because I was in college and like everyone was partying. And sure, I was... I was definitely worse than everybody, but I thought, you know, one day I'd wake up and I wouldn't want to, you know, smoke 10 foot or six foot bong loads um, yeah. and, you know, drink an entire bottle of gallo wine to myself and walk around my dorms pantless. Yeah. Um, Sucks. Yeah. But I just thought one day I would be like, I'd wake up and I'd be a grown up, and then I continued to get worse while everyone around me like seemed to grow up. And mm -hmm. I knew that I had a problem, but I didn't think that I was an alcoholic because in my mind, you know, an alcoholic was, you know, somebody who drank out of a paper bag under the bridge and I had all the things. I had a family, I had a career, I had friends and all that stuff. So I was like sure that I wasn't an alcoholic. Yeah. Did you, did you have a, the same kind of misconception? Yeah, I kind of did. Like I did a lot of uh, cocaine as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it was quite easy to imagine myself in a fancy rehab with like a, a, juice smoothie of some kind you know but it wasn't so easy like I didn't really even equate the word alcoholic to what I was like an alcoholic is one it's a man they're 50 plus years old um you know they've got the 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 trench coat on haven't they and they've got yeah the paper bag like with the bottle in it um and that would you know I just don't fit that mold I remember like one of the first times I tried to you know sort myself out I was going to this sort of um uh drug and alcohol center and I'd got in a cab for them to drop me off and they said to me in the cab you know be careful because uh there's loads of addicts there and I you know so like you know even at my worst I didn't quite fit the mold of what an alcoholic look looked like so it was really difficult for me to get my head around that one. Yes. I relate to you. Yeah. Do you think that that is maybe part of the reason that you're outspoken and honest about your addiction problem? Because, you know, I think people look at you and you probably get this reaction a lot. Like you don't look like an alcoholic, like you don't look like somebody who would have had that problem. But as anybody who's been through recovery knows, like, alcohol does not discriminate. Like it doesn't matter your age, your gender, your social status, how much money you have, what you look like, mm -hmm. like it gets everybody, yeah. you know, if you've got that in you. So is that, is that part of your motivation behind speaking out about your problems? Absolutely. I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with alcohol in itself. There's nothing wrong with the substance. It's my relationship with it. Right. But that taken into account, I knew the dangers of the big two, you know, crack, heroin. I didn't touch those. Mm -hmm. You know, it. I may have done in the end, who knows. But I think awareness around the danger of alcohol is, is not quite there. Um, you know, it, it was worse for me than the hard ones. It was worse for me to give up than the hard ones. And it crept up on me. And it, yes, I think part of that was because, you know, I'm not an alcoholic, but you know, I, I can't be an alcoholic. And the, the second reason is I think like a lot, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll relate if you're in 12 step, like a lot of recovery is based on removal of the shame, like removal of the stigma, like being able to relate to other people, being able to feel like you're not, you're not by yourself. And uh, I'll never forget the first time I met someone, my gender and my age, who was sober, like, five years I was like two weeks and I thought well she can do that so I can probably do it you know I think yeah that's important and then what was one of the things that was stopping you or what were some of the things that was stopping you from going into recovery earlier you know I'm not sure if it's the same in the states um 
But over here, I bounced in and out of many places. I bounced in and out of doctors and counsellors and back again. And, you know, I'd never really... um. I'd never really been encouraged to look at how much I was actually drinking. I remember the first time I calculated the units I was drinking um, and it shocked me, but it wasn't what was focused on. Again, I think maybe because of my age um, and at that time when I was trying to seek that kind of help, I was still, you know, I could still brush my hair, you know? Um, So there was that initially. And I, I I think later on, it was just that, um, you know, it was like, they say like you you don't want to drink but you just can't imagine being able to survive life without alcohol or drugs like you build up so many shameful things that you've done in addiction well I did and uh I needed an escape from those like to to think about living without you know any kind of escape route from all those feelings was it was impossible for me and it was a really scary thing to do Hmm. yeah and I can imagine that you know I just, I mean, obviously this was my thought and I've talked to so many other people who had the same thoughts. It was like, how could you, you know, I mean, drinking is so ingrained in, I mean, especially in British culture, you know, and I say this as somebody who's like, you know, comes, my mom was British, my dad was South African, but he lived in London with her for 10 years. And, you know, alcohol was a huge part, like all, all my whole family drinks, you know, and, and my parents actually thought that the whole like you can't drink until you're 21 thing in America was ridiculous Mm -hmm. and their whole thing was like oh you know we'll just you know we'll teach our children how to drink we'll let them have a glass of wine every once in a while like when they're 12 or 13 because that's what we do back at home and you know we're all fine and um my brother and sister turned out okay but like I did not (laughs) you know and so my question to you is actually, do you believe that alcoholism is something that is you're born with, or do you think it comes from your environment, or do you think that maybe it's a mixture of both? I kind of like, you know, I've, I've, I read a lot around this kind of stuff. Like I'm quite interested in this sort of thing, and uh, I kind of feel like the, the opinion I f- sit with best is the fact it's a bit of both um there's a psychologist his name is Gabor Mate and he says there's no real gene for addiction but there is kind of like a a predisposition based on how sensitive you are as a person and uh I can certainly identify with that like you know in in my drinking and using days I thought I was just one of these people that didn't give a f about anything you know like my home is where I lay my hat this kind of thing But when I look back to my childhood and now, especially as a newly sober person, I'm one of the most sensitive people I know, you know, and uh, I think everybody goes through stuff. Every everyone's life happens. You know, there's there's always stuff in everyone's life. But a sensitive person will will react to that in a way that is perhaps different to someone less sensitive and you know, a quick escape route from your feelings becomes a lot more um, appealing, you know? So to me, that really sits well with me, but it's, it's, it's an interesting question, actually. You know, they, they don't know, do they? They don't know. I think they've, um, they figured out some people process alcohol specifically different to others. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, I, that kind of thing really fascinates me to be honest. Yeah. Same. I mean, I know some people who, there was one woman that was in, one of the rehabs that I went to, I went to a couple, I just shop around. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and she like, didn't have her first drink until, I don't know, she was like 35 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like she hadn't touched alcohol. And then she became like a raging, you know, fall down drunk within like five years. Yeah. So, you know, she wasn't raised around it. And, you know, my whole issue was, I thought the people who were alcoholics had some like horrible trauma from their childhood that they were trying to escape some sexual trauma or physical trauma or mental trauma or like was, you know, just lived in some awful situation. And, and I didn't have any of those things, you know, Mm. I had like this, like kind of blessed gifted, gifted life. I love my family and we're all very close. And so I just, you know, I couldn't understand like why I ended up like that. You know what I mean? Like it just didn't make any sense to me at all. But 
that's why I definitely believe because my father was an alcoholic too. And like, I have a lot of other people in my family that are alcoholics. Mm -hmm. So, so I definitely believe there's some like genetic predisposition towards that. And yeah, maybe it's the, maybe it's the idea of being sensitive. That makes sense to me. You know, I was sensitive to a lot of things that happened to me as a kid, not like horrible things, but you know, just like the stupid, like getting bullied at school, which like everybody goes through, you know? Yeah, definitely. You do get like amongst my sort of friends in recovery and people that I talk to in recovery. Yeah, we've got the whole like we drank too much and we used too many drugs in common. But there's lots of like ways of thinking and seeing things and sort of almost character traits that are quite similar, right, as well, which, mm -hmm. I again, I find really interesting, like whether it's genetic or or not. Um, but yeah, same as you, like uh, I have family history of drinking and you know, like other partners that have been addicts and things like that. So, yeah. So now that you don't have alcohol as a crutch, as that, you know, mode of escapism, how do you deal with issues that come up in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. So that's like evolved over time, thankfully, because uh, when I gave up to the drink and drugs, it was initially like 12 Red Bulls a day and like 40 cigarettes. So that was my coping. That was, that was my solution. <laughs> um, I, uh, it sounds like really like, I sound like one of those people that I hated before I got sober, but I meditate. Um, I like nature. Um, I work out, you know, I, I have to talk. Like sometimes I forget to do that. Um, but I have to talk, I have a therapist, I have a sponsor, I have another sponsor and another, you know, so, uh, it's, it's a full on maintenance job, but I enjoy those things. Like I actually enjoy those things. And, uh, you know, they don't work quite as instantly as a line of Coke or a shot of vodka, but they don't have a come down at the end. So that's a good bit. And, you know, maybe it'll evolve more in time. I'm not sure, but you know. Yeah. I mean, I will say like in the long run, those things definitely, I, I had an, a, a day, you know, a couple of weeks ago that I got pretty like depressed and run down and, you know, I did like the things that I do, like, like you said, the meditation, I do writing, I call somebody and I definitely didn't feel like better right away. Not like, you know, and I, I was thinking, I'm like, God, if I had a shot of vodka, like I would feel great, like instantly, you know, yeah. that instant gratification is, is sometimes like, you kind of miss it, but yeah. you know, the next day I felt much better. And I was like, the, I would not feel better the next day. If I had drank, I would feel worse the next day. Cause the problems don't go away. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It is that instant gratification thing. Like if you're a Coke addict or an alcoholic, they're pretty like two seconds, you know, that you're not mm -hmm. going to wait more than two seconds without fixing your feelings. Like, mm -hmm. and a lot of it for me has been learning to just sit with how I feel you know yes. and that's awful like I hate Ugh. no like <laughs> no like yep you know yeah yeah no I can I can definitely relate to that there's nothing and I still have a hard time sitting in my feelings and I have to like make myself do it and you know I have to yeah. tell myself like it's okay to be sad it's okay to not feel good you know yeah. I think like and I think also too a lot of times we're conditioned to be like buy this thing use this thing do this thing to feel better instantly like you know, with human beings, like we, life is ups and downs. Like we all go through that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's okay to have a sad day. I remember I had kiss of sins on, I don't, I don't know if you know her, but she's a pretty well-known adult entertainer, mm -hmm. somebody who I adore. And, you know, I remember she told me like, she, she embraces the sad days. Like she plays sad music and she like cries and like, she really embraces it and she holds it and she's okay with it. And then she moves through it. And I don't know, to me, that was like this crazy revelation. I'm like, you enjoy your sad days? Like you embrace it? You don't spend all day trying to run away from those feelings? Like you actually sit with them? And I was like, I don't know, like I never forgot that when she said it. And I think about that often when I get in that place. And I'm like, be more like Kisses. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Like embrace the sad days. Like it is an interesting thing. Like as I've like, you know, you experience things sober, like, grief loss you know uh really depth of feeling that i i've never you know i the last sober feeling i'd had before that when i was 14 like so nobody knows grief that badly when they're 14 and has never lost anyone you know and suddenly there's all these feelings and i remember the first time 
realizing that I actually felt really good to cry. And now mm. I, I do feel a bit funny if I haven't cried for a while. I'm like, oh, like <laughs> my feeling, my feelings. But I've never tried that like a full on embracing of um, my sad emotions. I love that idea. I'm going to do that next time. She says, yeah. I'll probably last about five minutes, but like, yeah. it's a start. You know what? <laughs> Progress, not perfection. <laughs> So your mom appeared in an interview with you about your story. Uh, how did your fiction, how did your addiction affect your relationship with your family? Yeah. So like you said, like I had a really loving family, um, but I was not one of those nice, happy, spacey, drunk addicts. I was aggressive, violent, verbally abusive. I stole from them. I brought police to their door, you know, alongside a bunch of unsavory people. And, you know, like, I suppose you'll know this from your own journey, like there is no helping someone unless they want to be helped, right? So in the end, they have to cut ties and they did, you know? Um, so it's a very isolating thing, addiction. It, it, yeah, it isolated me completely from my family. But on the flip side, I'm kind of grateful for it because recovery teaches you how to be a human right it doesn't just teach you to stop you know it teaches me how to be a human so I don't want to do those things and through that I think I've become a better daughter sister than I ever was like I actually have a really beautiful very close relationship uh with my family members now that I, I don't think I'd have had that anyway I was I was a bit of an asshole whether I was drunk or sober you know so, so yeah I mean I've actually been able to help a couple of family members who've come to me about similar things. And that's such a nice feeling. That's such a cool yeah. feeling. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's great. It's great now. Um, hmm. Isn't yeah, it funny? Actually, about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't it funny how like your worst trait, right? Your biggest curse ends up becoming your greatest blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I went to a meeting once when I was, you know, trying to get sober and, you know, I, I was not one of those people who like walked into a meeting was like, I'm at home. I love this. This is great. I'll never drink again. Like it yes. took me a minute, you know, I was very, very resistant. And uh, this woman was like talking about all the pain and the anguish and, you know, all of those things that, you know, addicts and alcoholics go through. And she goes, if I could take that all away from you, I wouldn't because it's part of the journey and it's what gives you that gift of desperation and it's what makes you who you are and it's what makes recovery and being on the other side such a blessing. And I was like, what a bitch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was my first thought. I was like, you wouldn't, you would allow these people to suffer. And it wasn't until I got on the other side of recovery that I understood what she meant. And it's true. It's like, and another friend of mine kind of likened us to like people who've survived a shipwreck, you know, mm. and like only other people can kind of understand what it was like to be on that sinking ship and to somehow like swim your way, you know, to the shore gasping for a breath, you know, barely alive. Mm. And it, and it's true. And just like you, it's made me a better person because it forced me to look at myself in a way that I wouldn't have done yeah. If it wasn't like a matter of life and death, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes I see other people who are not addicts or alcoholics, like struggling with, you know, things. And, and I'm like, man, if only you were an alcoholic, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I feel like blessed to have been cursed with this thing that forced me to seek help and connect with other people like me and adopt a program where like, I have to like rigorously like maintain my mental health and like look at my part and like take accountability and like all of these things that like are so uncomfortable and we don't want to do but like we have to and like what a bizarre strange blessing in the end a hundred percent it's like it's funny because I always kind of wanted to be one of those people like one of those people that actually likes self-development and seeks out spirituality in some form or other and you know, looks after their well-being and everything I said, I said I hated, but secretly I was jealous of, right? But mm -hmm. I was never going to do it. Like, I was never going to do it unless I realized that if I did not do that, I would probably either go insane or die. You know, <laughs> like it, it is that kind of gift of desperation. I think it's 
quite cool to remember that as well when I'm going through crappy stuff in sobriety. Like, you still struggle, right? And um, yeah. it's hard and it almost makes me feel sick to even... I want to wallow in it sometimes. I want to be like, no, it's really awful. But, you know, like, if you've learned from such a dark time as addiction to recovery, whatever you're going through now is going to be a learning experience. And I think, mm -hmm. like, that attitude, it's uh, got me through a lot of things, you know? Yeah. Even though, like, I prefer sometimes to just stay in my depression. Like, I can't help but believe that's true because I've had that experience before. Yeah. So, yeah, it, like you say, it's a blessing, really. Yeah, I definitely – it's shifted my perspective where I look at things as challenges rather than problems. And even if something's not going to work out the way I want it to, like I know there's going to be something that I can gain from that experience. There's going to mm. be something that I'm going to learn that's going to benefit me later. Like mm. everything is going to work out the way it's supposed to, and in the end I'm going to be grateful for this shitty thing that's happening to me right now. And that is a hard change of perspective to have because we used to just drink over that, right? Mm -hmm. Like we ne we didn't have faith in the future. Mm. Yeah, it was like now or not now. And that, that was kind of it. But yeah, it, it really is like that. It's like someone said it to me, win or learn. And that really is what it is, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I think it teaches you a level of like detachment as well from what happens. Um, you know, like I'm not perfect, but yeah like like you described quite often I can feel like something's crap but know in a more wiser part of my mind that I don't know if it's crap or not I don't know if this is exactly what I need to learn right now you know mm -hmm. like and it's the same as like you come into like 12 step or wherever you go like you know people recover in all different ways but you come in there like you were the same age as me, right? And as at that age just sitting around with a bunch of people on a Friday night or whatever it feels like well, my life has officially ended, right? This is rubbish. <laughs> I was like, you, I didn't like it. Like, yeah. I was like, yay. Like, I absolutely hated it. And I thought it was the worst thing to ever happen, but it, it can be the best thing, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about some sexy stuff. <laughs> we're going to talk about Eliza's OnlyFans and her controversial billboard. So stick around. We'll be right back. Have you guys noticed how we've been upgrading everything? Phones, cars, even our coffees have gone gourmet. But what about bedroom performance? This is where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is the chewable tablet that's elevating sexual experiences everywhere. And before you start shifting uncomfortably in your seat, relax. Just as your internet browsing history is nobody's business but your own, your access to Blue Chew is just as discreet. Prescribed online and shipped directly to your door, Blue Chew has taken the embarrassment out of in-person doctor's visits and trips to the pharmacy. This little tablet is revolutionizing the way that guys approach their intimate moments. So are you considering leveling up? Visit bluechew.com today and meet with a licensed medical provider to assess your individual needs. And you can try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code Holly to receive your first month for free. Remember, it's not just about performance, it's about confidence. And Blue Chew will bring you both. All right, everybody, we are back. So, Eliza, what made you decide to actually start an OnlyFans? So, after I got sober, I got a little job in a preschool. And uh, I loved it, but it didn't pay very well. Uh, so I just started doing like, I got into the gym. So I started doing like fitness shoots, fitness modeling shoots on the side. Um, I used to model when I was younger and I was pushing it a bit by then in terms of my age, but like, Hey, like I thought I could earn a bit of money and, um, I just put some stuff on Instagram and it grew and, um, I, I'd left the preschool by this point and a friend who was an OnlyFans creator just suggested that I sign up and I thought, well, it might help pay for my fuel, you know? So Thought I'd give it a go. And uh, how how did it start off? Like, were you just posting clothed photos? Like, how quickly did people sign on? Yeah, so um, when I was a little bit younger, I did do a, a bit of a stint nude modeling. I did some glamour. I did some sort of, like, artist's figure modeling stuff. So I was quite comfy nude. I had some backlog of that stuff. Um, so I posted some of that out. 
posted some long lingerie pics, you know. Um, that was kind of it. Um, but the response, like, from people was, um, well, I thought I'd earned, like, a few hundred pounds or something like that. And I think in my f- very first week, it was a 1,000. And so I thought, oh, hmm, it might, you know, I'll keep posting and j- just see, you know. But I didn't have a clue how to run a page, you know, or anything like that. I didn't. Know. Yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, you figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, uh, at what point did you tell your family that this was the career you were pursuing and were they supportive of it? Um, I think like, it's kind of like that technique where you have to tell someone something they, they don't like. So instead you tell them something worse first and then say, oh no, no, it's, that was a joke, but this, and then they don't take it so hard. Right. So I guess it was the same because like, you know, once you've been a raging addict and like tried to take your life multiple times and in the police cells and stuff so you're doing an only fans and people are like eh, no, all right like so there's <laughs> there's a bit of that but i think also like <laughs> also sense. i think they saw the grind behind it you know mm-hmm. like i think they saw the effort that and the work because it's a lot of like you know you take hot pics and i really enjoy that part but there's a lot of laptop stuff there's a lot of admin um mm-hmm. and uh so i think they saw that you know i think they saw that and they were pretty chill from the start yeah and, you know, OnlyFans is what really sets it apart from, you know, other platforms that came before it was it's sure it's about the content and the sexy fix in the video, but so much of it is about connecting with your fans and talking to people. It's a lot of talking to people. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Mm. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I didn't actually, I didn't, um, and uh, I'm a bit of an all or nothing person. Like if I'm doing something, I want to be really, really give it my all. So I did. And yeah, it, it got quite exhausting. Like I didn't know about, you know, making sure you take days off or getting someone else to schedule your posts, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, there was a lot of talking, a lot of talking. Yeah. Do you have, um, do you enjoy talking and connecting with your fans? I do. And I think it's actually it's very much like real life sort of relationships, friendships, if you will. Some people you click with and some people you just don't. Mm -hmm. Like I've had, I have some people that were there since the very start, which is embarrassing for me because the first selfies I took were absolutely terrible, right? But they were there from the start. And you get some people that you just have a little chat with, like you might talk sexy with once and that'd be that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Earlier this year, you bought ad space on billboards in London, which feature a photo of you in a bra, your name, and the OnlyFans and Instagram logos. What made you get have this idea to advertise publicly? Yeah, so I think there was like a two two part thing to that. I think OnlyFans is now an established part of digital culture. If you've got a mobile phone, you probably know what OnlyFans is, you know. The the sort of like people kind of just turning a blind eye to it and pretending it doesn't exist was frustrating as someone who operates a legitimate business, pays their taxes, employs people, you know, follows the law. Um, so it's a bit of a stirring of the pot. It's a bit of a statement. Um, but underneath that, you know, I do find based on what we've just talked about with addiction recovery and like, you know, I do find like the fact that it's still stigmatized and shamed quite concerning, um, you know, without like bumming out the whole podcast. Like I lost two friends last year to, uh, they, they took their own lives, um, in my industry and people really struggle with the isolation and the shame around it all. Um, Mm. yeah, I know from sort of my experience in addiction that, it's not the substance. It's like the shame, the secrecy, the stigma, you know, that's an ideal habitat for really bad mental well-being, Right. So yeah. I suppose my billboards were a little, a little nudge to maybe legitimize this a little bit because it is legit, you know? So mm-hmm. I guess there was a two, two part reason really. And yeah. And I mean, you know, I think we can all, we all know that like it's mostly sex work on OnlyFans, but yeah. they also have, you know, people who don't do nudes, who do fitness training, who do cooking shows. So it's, it's other things as well. 
So what was the response to your billboards? I think like, you know, shock and awe always make the news. So like the negative. Especially in England, your tabloids are out of fucking control. Oh, God. Like- There's nothing better than like a British tabloid. The shit that you guys put out there is I know. nuts. I know. <laughs> Like if, if the headline has more than like three syllables in it is it's, it's too highbrow anyway. So like, they don't even run it. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, like, um, yeah, the, the, the negative stuff got most <laughs> media attention, but actually I was really encouraged. Like the response on the whole was really positive from people like in the industry, but also outside the industry. Like my mum and dad were proud. My brothers watched Did the TV debates. That was kind of cool. Like, and in general, people were, were pretty chill. It, it might just be because I, I associate myself with um, quite open-minded people. But I was actually pleasantly surprised. Yeah. So tell me about the negative response. Whenever there's someone doing something a bit different or someone challenging what's currently normal, especially if it's around sexuality, and especially if you're a woman, like there's always going to be pushback, you know, I, I did expect negative, uh, negative responses. Um, in my view, like any response is better than just pretending it doesn't exist. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I welcome that as well. It starts, it started a conversation and that's, that's exactly what I kind of wanted. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it actually was, I mean, not everybody, you know, some people's views are their views. But a lot of people, it was just lack of education on what OnlyFans actually was and, and what it isn't, you know? Um, a lot of people, when they they learned that it was actually quite a safe place, you know, you can't just rock up and join OnlyFans. You have to be of a certain age. You have to prove your ID. You have to have a credit card, all, the, all these things. It's kind of the same as walking into a like an off-license, we say over here, and buying alcohol. You can't just do that. You like you, mm -hmm. There's certain things that you have to make sure you do first like you you know it's quite a protected place you know so mm -hmm. I think a lot of people kind of maybe change their mind a little bit after that you know after knowing that so people made complaints to the advertising standards authority in the UK um what ended up being the ruling on that yeah um they uh you know I I'm glad like I did actually quite heavily research the guidelines before I put the ads up and um they said they were fine yeah so all good even in this country we're, we're quite prudish over here we don't often even see a bikini so yeah I was quite happy <laughs> so you were then interviewed on Piers Morgan Uncensored a show that is a pretty conservative audience um what was that like for you yeah like <laughs> I can't lie and say I wasn't nervous um Especially like I was on a Zoom a bit like this. And um, while you're waiting to go on, you, you're watching the show live as it happened. And there were these guys, they were debating over something different, but there was this furious like shouting match going on between these guys. And I was thinking, oh, do I, do I have to bring that energy? Like, is mm -hmm. that what, you know, it's 10 p.m. Like, I should be in bed. <laughs> like, so there's a bit of that. Um, but, you know, I was actually quite honored to be on there. Like, I, I was honest to be on there. I was honored to be debating with the people that I was. And uh, it just, it, they did their job. The billboards, therefore, did their job. So, yeah. What was uh, Piers Morgan like specifically? Did you find that he was what? neutral or did he seem like kind of skewed one way or the other? He was actually away, which was interesting because his, uh, his replacement was female. Um, it was a woman. Mm -hmm. She was kind of neutral. She was just facilitating the debate between me and me and another lady. Um, so it was definitely not a shouting match, which I was happy about. You know, that was that yeah, was, <laughs> that made it made it easier. And actually, we had really like we had a really good conversation. You know, yeah. Now the woman that you were debating kept saying that you were promoting pornography. Um, do you consider what you do to be pornography? Yeah, I do. Um, but kind of my argument is that, you know, whether I have little billboards up or not, I don't need to promote pornography. Like, I remember when I was doing this Piers Morgan thing, I had I was armed with stats just in case, you know. And um, 
I found a really interesting thing out, which was the the audience of Pornhub is bigger than the whole of the UK. Like so, and a huge. It's like it's like this. It's like the sixth most visited website in the world. Yeah, and you know, like on par with Amazon and Google and Facebook. You know, it's crazy. yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. So, yeah, what I do is is pornography. Um, but it, I don't think it's porn, which is a menace to our society. I think it's how we're dealing with it, which mm. is essentially at the moment we are not dealing with it. Not I'm talking mm. about my own culture. Like, it's still this taboo thing that everybody engages with and nobody talks about. Like, mm. again, it's the same as alcohol, drugs, gambling. We've seen, like, time after time that it's not these things, but it's our sort of, like, demonization and criminalization of these things that make them really unhealthy. So... Yeah, I guess I, 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 I guess that's what I'd say to, to in response to um, people thinking it was a problem to promote a platform which has porn on it. You know, you know, you bring up a, a point that is that I love to argue a lot, and it's this idea that it's not. I don't think that porn specifically is harmful. I think the stigma surrounding it is what's harmful. Mm. It's the stigma that isolates people from their families. It's stigma that, you know, breaks up relationships. Um, it's the stigma that makes people feel isolated. Mm. It's the stigma that doesn't allow people from to move on and, and get other jobs. You know, like one of the most frustrating things for me is, you know, this, this outcry of like, porn's not a real job like go you'll see it in the comments all the time go get a real job people will leave the adult industry and they will try to get a real job Mm -hmm. a real job and they'll get denied because they were in porn i mean people you know they'll have like this whole i've talked to girls who you know worked in adult for a long time even like crew members you know who work behind the scenes and then they go out and they try to get gigs in mainstream and they have this hole in their resume because they can't put that they worked in porn. If they ever like, you know, God forbid you to try to apply for a job at Nickelodeon or Disney, like there's yeah. no way they will hire you. No way. It's yeah. crazy. The record. Yeah. Like you don't get that with any other job really, do you? No. You and it, it, they, they treat you like you were like in prison or you're like yeah. a felon. It's just like, you know, and it's like these are consenting adults engaging in legal activities. You know, these are not like criminals and sexual deviants. And, you know, these are not people who are like dangerous to society. In fact, they're fulfilling a really large, like, you know, talk about, um, uh, oh my God, how am I spacing? Talk about. (laughs) supply and demand sorry so yeah talk about like supply and demand there's so much demand for porn and here are these people supplying it but you know society hates them and stigmatizes them and isolates them and you know that to me is like that's the real danger is how we treat people in the adult industry you know especially like you know one one example that that i've often pointed to was there was this there's a case here actually was in Oregon. There's a, a woman named Nicole and she was in the adult industry for like a year, maybe, you know what I mean? And she discovered it wasn't for her. So she left and she went to nursing school because she wanted to become a nurse and they discovered what she had done and they like pushed her out of school, you know? And she ended up suing the school and she won, which was like a landmark um, mm-hmm. event. But, you know, people have I just did an interview with Ali Eve Knox. The financial discrimination is insane. Mm -hmm. You know, people can't apply for loans. They can't apply for mortgages Mm -hmm. because of what they do. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. It's um, quite archaic considering, you know, it, I think people have this opinion that porn and sex work is only for people that are desperate and forced to be in it. Or in some way, you know, uh, not choosing to be in it. And the consumers are people with no morals that can't get it any other way. And that's just not really the case. Like, obviously, you know, there is that side of sex work. But more and more, especially with the, you know, the event of like online platforms where your regulation is possible and, you know, autonomy is possible. It's quite often a choice. 
and it's quite often just fun like you know um yeah I think people still have that that view that it's you know unsanitary and unhealthy and only a certain type of people person does that and only a certain type of person consumes it when it's just not not the case you know yeah. And I would argue that, you know, if you want to say, okay, only a certain type of person will do that, you may be right to an extent because there are certain people who may be interested in doing it, but stay away from it specifically because of the stigma. Mm -hmm. I've talked to many people who are very interested in getting the adult industry, but they're like, my family would disown me. I don't know what people would think. Like, I'm worried about how it would affect like my future, like all of these things, you know? Um, yep. and that to me is so much more telling of society's reaction to, to it than the thing itself. I mean, I could go uh, on and on also too, about like how, you know, people who are anti-sex work are often like, you know, inherently and unaware that like they're misogynistic cause you know, the idea is so pervasive that like all women are victims and women don't actually like sex. And you know, if they're exhibitionists then there's something like wrong with them, but you know, like Ben, you know, that's totally normal. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you know, it's, it's nice to hear that, um, articulated so well, because that's the kind of feeling I have. Like, yeah, I think it just, it comes back to the idea of it that just being a bit of an archaic view. It, we've come so far in so uh, so many other areas, and this has just been left back in like the nineteen forties or before, you know. And mm-hmm. there's a bit of like a dissonance between. I, I I I put it down to the fact we just don't talk about it enough. We just don't talk mm-hmm. about it enough. So our ideas don't develop. Our views don't develop. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you could change the public's perception about one facet of the industry, what would it be? Yeah, I think I'd want to say like not all sex work is seedy, unregulated and only done by those who are forced or desperate and only consumed by those who are just immoral and cretins, you know. You know, it can be to some people, it can be so much fun really empowering and a very safe way to, you know, satisfy a a market, you know, (laughs) like, and you make good money and you have fun. And same with consumers. Like they're just average regular people. They're they're just having fun. Um, So I just think, you know, while on balance, like there are, there are always going to be, you know, gray areas, hopefully less and less, once we like shed a bit more light on the situation and and take away that stigma for a lot of people it's it's a fun and safe way to make money and for a lot of consumers it's just a bit of fun you know and um i think it's important that people have that perspective too when Mm -hmm. it comes to making up their mind about how they feel about sex work yeah Mm -hmm. one last question um i have for you you know there's a lot of people who talk about uh pornography being a public health crisis and that's it's, you know, an addiction and it like ruins families as somebody who, you know, is a recovering addict. How do you feel about that criticism? I think any activity that can give pleasure to a person can be addictive. Shopping, you know, some people are addicted to, you know, food, you know, it can all be like that. You know, I don't think the problem, again, like the same as I've said about alcohol, I've got nothing against alcohol as a substance, you know, alcohol's alcohol, porn's porn. It's it's how we view it and how we deal with it, you know. It's, I don't, like, I think you said it as well, like it, it's not so much the activity or the behaviour, but it's the shame associated with it, the isolation isolation associated with it and I know my drinking and using cycle went like this you drink and use you feel awful about yourself you can't talk to anyone how do you deal with the feelings you do it again you know and my solution my recovery was talk about talk about things you know learn what learn what it looks like to do things safely and learn what it looks like to do things unhealthily you know Mm -hmm. I think the same applies in any area that you know an adult can seek pleasure from. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the interesting thing about porn too is that, you know, it's wrapped up in so much shame before you even get there, right? Yeah. Like alcohol generally isn't. Alcohol yeah. is sold to us as this fun experience for adults and you know, the social lubricant and it can even be classy and high end and, you know, look at this gorgeous martini I'm drinking on a private plane kind of thing. Um, whereas porn is packaged in this whole idea of like shame before you even get there. So especially if it becomes, and you know, and, and there's been studies that have shown and the American Psychi Psychiatric Association, I believe it's called, I could be wrong on that, but they, they, don't designate porn as an addiction as officially like it doesn't meet like the scientific requirements as official addiction what it, it is is a compulsion mm -hmm. which you know like you said can be applied to so many things and yeah. I mean you know talk let's I mean let's talk if you want to talk about addiction or you know compulsion let's talk about like social media you know yeah. I mean like what that is a problem too let's talk about Netflix you know a lot of people consume things compulsively but there's so much shame wrapped around porn that you know, a lot of people don't address it. They're ashamed to talk about it. Um, they're ashamed to explore maybe why um, this has become a problem for them. And also too, I think be, it has been shown that if people come from a very conservative religious background, they think mm -hmm. that like, you know, they tend to miss in their mind, the amount of time that they spend consuming porn, you know, is, is so, is actually far greater than what, most people would consider um, a problem because of specifically what they're consuming. They don't think they should be consuming it at all. Mm -hmm. So there's like, there's a lot of like very, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot to it. And it's really interesting, you know, when you talk to, I've had a lot of like therapists on, um, doctors, uh, Dr. Nicole Prousey and Dr. David Lay, who, you know, articulate all of this in a much, more eloquent way than I do. But, um, yeah, there's a lot to look at it. And I think it just goes back to, again, what you and I were talking about at the beginning is like, I find the stigma to be the biggest problem really. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to watch those videos. I'm going to give those a watch with the doctors on. And yeah, yes. it, it's also motive, isn't it? I think with further discussion, like say in my recovery, like from mine was drugs. I mean, it's an obvious one is it's alcohol. Like it's obvious. I was taught about like, am I, am I enjoying or am I using? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is one of the discussions. Like I've had this discussion with, with subscribers on my website. Like, are you enjoying or are you trying to get something more than what this is from this? It's, it's these kinds of things. It's a really complex thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it, it needs more conversation. You can't just, you can't just, yeah, you, like we said at the beginning, you can't just pretend, you know, it's not a thing. Like, literally, like the stats on how many people watch porn is, you know. I think you're hard pressed to find people that have never encountered porn, even like yeah. some very soft things on social media. So yeah, it's a really complex thing. And I, I think it just highlights the fact that it, it needs discussion. It's, it's one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eliza, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. I'm so happy we could make this work. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Eliza Rose Watson, TikTok Eliza Rose Watson one and OnlyFans Eliza Rose Watson all the same. And um, yeah, it's been so, so lovely to come on. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my profiles. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next week. <laughs>